we've met briefly before. Um, I am the Director of Action and Advocacy on the State Board for the League of Women Voters. And we're very pleased to have you here. Um, I have heard this presentation. I heard it when you gave it to the University of Denver group. And um, I was very impressed and I thought it was something that the League needed to hear. So that's the reason why you're here. <laughs> So I'm going to introduce you. I think everybody's in for a very um, thought-provoking and informative presentation. And um, the topic of, dem of democracy is something that we've been working on in various ways. Of course, probably from our founding, but um, more concertedly lately. And we have a tagline, if you will, making democracy work. So. Uh, Attorney General Phil Weiser is the 39th Attorney General of Colorado. As the state's chief legal officer, Attorney General Weiser is committed to protecting the people of Colorado, defending the rule of law, and building a department of law that serves all Colorado effectively. Public service is one of Weiser's core values. Previously, Weiser served as a professor of law and dean of the University of Colorado Law School, which I am familiar, I did not attend, but tangentially attended, <laughs> as a professor of law and dean of the University of, of um, where he founded the Silicon Flatiron Center for Law, Technology and Entrepreneurship. Weiser served in senior leadership positions in the Obama administration and was appointed to serve as a deputy assistant attorney general in the US Department of Justice and as senior advisor for technology and innovation at the White House's National Economic Council. Earlier in his career, Mr. Weiser co-chaired the Colorado Innovation Council and served in President Bill Clinton's administration and the Department of Justice. After graduating law school, he worked in Denver for Judge David Ebel on the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals and held two clerkships at the United States Supreme Court. For Justice Brian White, also from Colorado, I believe, and um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Attorney General Weiser lives in Denver with his wife, Dr. He Heidi Wald, and their two children. So you may proceed. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Pleasure to be with you all. I want to give this talk in a few parts, and I'm going to add a little bit to the last time you heard it, because today is an auspicious day to talk about the state of our democracy. The Major League Baseball decision to move the All-Star Game to Colorado from Georgia is apropos of Georgia's situation where they have not shown a commitment to the principle that the goal of democracy is to enable everyone's vote to be counted and to enable people to participate in the political process. Second, I want to talk about truth and the rule of law. And third, I want to talk about empathy. And th those all fit together uh, at a time that is fraught, is meaningful. Why do I say that? Because it was three months ago that we saw the raid on the Capitol on January 6th. It's two days from now that we celebrate Holocaust Remembrance Day, all of which connect up to the following principle. We're living in a time when our very democracy is at risk. And we shouldn't underestimate that risk. And we should recognize the opportunities and the threats. We had an election in the fall where more people voted than had voted for president in a century. When you set a record, a positive record, usually that's a cause for celebration. If our goal is democracy, is public engagement, we knocked it out of the park. A good baseball metaphor. 
Unfortunately, the times we're living in are so politically polarized that that accomplishment was overshadowed. So overshadowed. So in the ideal world, we would set records of that kind and we'd ask the following question. What enabled us to do so well? If you were a company and you set sales record in a quarter, you would say, what enabled us to set those records? If you were a baseball player and you set a home run record, you'd say, why did I play so well that year? If you're a democracy and you set a voter turnout record, you should ask, what enabled that record? It's not a hard question to ask. It's not a hard question to answer. We saw Colorado's model of voting, giving people more time to vote, more options how to vote. We saw it brought nationwide. Colorado, by the way, is number two in voter turnout. Anyone here know who number one is? Go ahead, Tony. Minnesota. Minnesota. I bet there, AG, that we could beat them this time. We didn't. But for a long time, you may remember, Hertz was the number one car rent rental, and Avis was number two, and their commercial was, we're number two, but we try harder. I kind of feel that way about us in Minnesota. We try really hard to have the best voting system we can, and we're proud of it. So Georgia set those records along with lots of other states. And Georgia had a choice. They could say, oh, this is good. We're enabling more people to vote. But if you look at the election law passed, its goal is not to replicate those successes, but I think to limit those opportunities. We don't know how many less pe few people would vote under the Georgia law just passed versus the election we had in the fall, but we do know something. The Georgia primary in the spring, if you lived in an African-American area, you waited online for 55 minutes to vote. If you lived in a white area, you generally waited on six minutes to vote. I would call that a tax on people's time, equivalent, if you will, to a poll tax. So the state of our democracy is in the balance because we just did set this incredible record. We did show the nation the Colorado model works. And we could be having a conversation around how we best enable the will of the people. Instead, we're having a conversation led by companies, including Major League Baseball. Will we have a true commitment to democracy? Here's my blog post talking about this, including talking about the uh, issues in Georgia I just mentioned from last spring. Now, what I want to focus on are two ideal pillars of a thriving democracy that we are not seeing in practice. First, truth and the rule of law. Second, empathy. First, truth and the rule of law. In the ideal world, we would have elections. They're counted with monitors of both parties. If the election is viewed as being reasonably close, you do a recount, perhaps counting every ballot by hand, monitored by both parties. You allow for court challenges based on any allegations of fraud so as to address any reasonable such allegations. Here's the good news. That pretty much describes what happened in Georgia this fall with regard to the presidential election. Why are we not in the ideal world? Because in the ideal world, after all that happens, the losing party says, the will of the people is being heard. I concede and I will have to listen to the people and learn from the experience. There are candidates who've lost elections and sought to reflect on why they lost, why they didn't do as well. And sometimes they've come back and run again and won after that learning experience. We didn't see that. We saw something that I don't believe I've ever seen, which is a US president calling up a secretary of state, asking that secretary of state to produce votes to sway an election. That phone call 
and a sustained campaign to delegitimize de the truth, to delegitimize the rule of law is a threat to democracy itself. And that is what all led up to January 6th, three months ago, where people who had been told a lie about the election showed up to protest an election. And in what was a perversion of democracy, you had the following line from Senator Josh Hawley, Senator Ted Cruz. There are people, they said, who don't believe this election was conducted reasonably and on the merits, they believe that there was fraud. As a result, said Senator Josh Hawley and Senator Ted Cruz, I'm gonna vote against accepting the results of the election because that's what people believe. Now, what they hadn't said is they themselves refused to say what is plain to seasoned lawyers. The election was conducted appropriately by the relevant procedures. Ballots were counted in the way I mentioned. Legal challenges were had through the proper channels and not a single one of those challenges succeeded. Unfortunately, what we learned is if you tell people a lie through channels where they're hearing it, they might believe it and then representatives will actually not stand up and tell the truth always, but may instead cater to those telling the lie. And we had a vote on January 6th after the storm of the Capitol that was arguably a vote in favor of or against democracy itself. Do you honor the will of the people or do you seek to undermine democratic elections? And that was a very sad day for our country, both for the storming of the Capitol, which was an attempted coup for lack of a better word, that the protesters or the rioters, however you want to refer to them, were talking about, let's get Nancy Pelosi, let's get Mike Pence. That is a scary dynamic and the um, videotapes that were shown were scary. It was also scary that people voted afterwards to refuse to accept an election that, again, there were legal challenges, but none of them showed any basis for anything else than accepting it. If we can't have elections through proper procedures, we can't have the courts play their role and then people accept it, particularly the candidates, we are threatening democracy itself. But there's a second threat. And the second threat may be even more invidious a lack of empathy and rising demonization. At its best, politics is a battle of ideas. At its best, politics is principled collaborative problem solving. It is the art of the possible. It is reasoned dialogue. That's the political ideal. The rhetoric we've seen of late should scare us. When you ask Democrats, when you ask Republicans, how would you feel if your child married someone from the other party? 1975, 10% people would say they might be concerned, five, 10%. Now, 45%. Politics should not be religion. Politics should not be tribal. Politics, as I said, should be a battle of ideas. However, if people see themselves in tribes and believe that their existence is threatened, they will be prone towards actions that are undemocratic, including the use of violence. And how do we overcome that demonization, that rising polarization, that rising hate? The only way to overcome it is through empathy. Because part of what is enabling the demonization, let's take a Republican who lives in Lamar, those Democrats in Denver don't care about me. And when you don't believe someone cares about you, that can drive a lot of other follow-on beliefs. By contrast, if you believe someone does care about you, that opens up the possibility that you might learn from them. We need a politics grounded in the ethic of care that we're all in this together. We all care about one another. If politics becomes all about 
a battle for power where any means is justified, then we are again losing our commitment to a democracy and to democratic self-governance. So where do we go from here? I believe we have to pay a lot of attention to the second issue because that may open up the door to the first issue. There's been tests on this from psychological perspectives. You don't convince people who believe a certain issue by giving them more facts. But if you convince people you care about them, they might be open to dialogue. In one sense, I view this as an experiment that I can conduct as a political official. I can go to Lamar and work with people to solve problems facing members of that community. I can go to Craig, Colorado and work with people in that community. I can work on building relationships based on respect with political leaders of the opposite party and I can publicly display that thereby dialing down the temperature, the demonization that is undermining our democratic republic. So I want to have a dialogue with you about this challenging moment we're in. It's not clear whether we will turn this around or even how we turn this around. What I can say is the stakes are very high. Ben Franklin famously said, after the Constitutional Convention, you have a republic as long as you can keep it. Every generation has to keep our democratic republic by committing to the rule of law, by committing to reason democratic discourse, respecting results of elections and the will of the people. And if we become untethered from those values, then we lose everything. Um, feel free to raise your hand um, or to put questions in the chat. I will start with the first question. Can you give us a sense for what you think is coming from the DOJ to hold certain GOP elected officials and the former president accountable for the Capitol riot? What do you think is happening to hold both Trump and Lindsey Graham for overturning the Georgia election results? Two good questions. I'll take the second one first. Um, reports are that Georgia is now conducting a investigation about violations of election law, including the former president. That's, that's what I have read and that's what I believe is happening now. Where that goes, we will see. The first one is what about the DOJ? The DOJ is doing a full investigation into the January 6th riot. And I worked with um, 46 other AGs, including the AG from DC, only four AGs did not sign a letter condemning the rioters and calling for accountability. And how far that accountability extends is a fair question. Will the DOJ itself investigate the former president? Um, a question the DOJ will have to consider is to the extent the impeachment trial did just that, is that in effect preclusive of other investigations? All right, Tony, I don't know if you wanna start with any questions or invite others. Well, I'm just, I'm thinking, I, I heard a lecture today about Reagan and that one of his really strong points was the, his ability to, to talk to people, to try to come to some kind of a consensus that yes, he made a few mistakes here and there, according to some people, uh, but, but that he, he was really, I mean, he, he could talk to the Russians and he could sit down and try to, try to work out the issues and that after Reagan, you can answer this, after Reagan, do we, did we lose that? How come we lost it? So here's what I would say. Reagan believed in democratic governance, small d, which means he understood there was other points of view that shouldn't be demonized 
but there would be dialogue and there would be principled compromise and problem solving. Immigration reform, social security reform, tax reform, during Reagan's presidency, three major legislative efforts that involved principled compromising and governance. And much more when Congress could operate in what was called regular order. Here's an example, the 1984 Cable Act. It was passed by bipartisan efforts including Tim Worth, then Congressman from Boulder, and Tom Talkey, then Congressman from Iowa, who were the respective leaders of the telecom subcommittee in the House, who held lots and lots of hearings, and who worked together on a bill. Why aren't we seeing that as much? Because the rhetoric is that people in the other party are evil, and you shouldn't work with them. There was a, an election a primary election in Colorado where the person running said of the incumbent, and this was an attack line, why would that person be sitting on committees with Democrats? The answer is because that's how democratic governance works, small d democratic governance. You have committees with both parties represented, they hear facts, they work through issues and they attempt to come to solutions. It's not meant to be a war of all against all of you're on one side, you're on one tribe, you're on the other tribe and you never give any compromise. That's not what politics was meant to be. When you go back to Reagan, that wasn't what happens. The problem with the current state of our politics in Washington, because in Colorado, this is another story. Among state AGs, it's another story. But in Washington, you're seeing almost no legislation happening through regular order with bipartisan collaboration. You're seeing efforts to pass laws on party line votes that get through the Senate on this reconciliation procedure to avoid a filibuster, which has been abused to require everything through the Senate to get 60 votes, which is not how the filibuster was intended. I'll get to that question in a minute. So where did this go off the rails? I think it was Tony's question. There's gonna be a lot of his historians debating this. I'll give you my best answer, which is a combination of political strategy led most notably by Newt Gingrich and media changes, starting with C-SPAN, then including cable news, and then including social media. It became easier to organize and galvanize in a way that it was focused on just your team and to demonize the other team. And it became harder to have relationships survive. That would be the glue, if you will, of collaborative problem solving. Tip O'Neill and Reagan famously would get together for a drink and just BS with one another. And they worked on those historic measures I mentioned. That isn't the world we live in anymore because there's all this rhetoric that's getting spun up such that, and John Boehner just read a book and Boehner sort of an interesting figure here because John Boehner in a way temperamentally wasn't of the Newt Gingrich approach to the world. Newt Gingrich is more like the Tea Party candidates who won in 2010. Boehner basically said, he said in 2010, Obama was born in this country. And that's what state of Hawaii said is good enough for him. And he got pilloried for saying that. That is a challenge to living in a world based on facts, in a world where we don't demonize people as an other. And Boehner, his book is a painful uh, sign of their times. And so if you contrast Boehner talking about the times we live in versus Reagan, those times, you can see the bookends of what has happened to our democratic republic. All right, a couple other questions now to get to. Um, one is, once trust is logged, people may not want to come to the table to discuss, how do you propose to motivate people to dialogue? Cindy, um, the short answer is you start at the local level. At local levels, and I, I was talking about this with Wayne Williams, who's now a city councilman in College Springs, people are confronted with the facts. Either you repaired the pothole or you didn't. Or crime rate is going up or it's going down. Or we are having better economic development or worse. So the local level, pardon the 
metaphor, the rubber hits the road and local officials have to produce and can't just posture. The state level, you're not as close to the rubber in the road, but you're closer. And so there's still more of a room for reasoned trust-based dialogue. And I, in the state AG world, even working with state AGs from other states, have that ability because I work within the rigor of the rule of law. So I work with a Republican AG from Nebraska on a case against Google, or I work with a Republican AG from Arizona on consumer protection in the airline industry. And we are working in a rigorous environment where the law is structuring how we look at problems so that it's not a political free-for-all. And there's mutual respect that gets built up. Um, next, Kathy, what are your thoughts about the filibuster? My thoughts are it's been abused. The filibuster should be saved for really important things. It shouldn't become a automatic requirement that every piece of legislation in the Senate needs 60 votes. Now, the question is, how do you fix the fact that it was abused in this way? There are a range of suggestions, including if you're going to hold the filibuster, you actually have to hold the floor and keep talking. Um, I'm not sure which of those fixes is the best one, but the Senate was not meant to be a 60 vote requirement for every piece of legislation. And um, the filibuster has gotten hijacked and now it is open for discussion how we address it. Um, I'm not sure which of those reforms will take hold, but the current situation where we've rendered the Senate dysfunctional is a bad one for current and future governance. Carol, are you concerned about the federal judicial branch upholding voter suppression laws. Carol, I appreciate the chance to talk about voting rights. Um, I am, I'm really concerned about the state of our voting rights. The Voting Rights Act passed, I think it was 2006, and I, I believe unanimous basis. Nonetheless, in the Shelby County case, the Supreme Court struck down a pre-clearance procedure that required the DOJ to pre-clear changes to voting procedure that could dilute or undermine the right to vote. Justice Ginsburg famously dissented and said, throwing out this plea clearance procedure is like throwing out your umbrella when it's raining, a good metaphor today, because you're not getting wet. But we did it. This term, the Supreme Court is hearing a case involving section two, which is an after the fact, not a before the fact protection measure. And I'm worried about that section of the Voting Rights Act being gutted as well. We'll see what comes out of that argument. So I am worried about voting rights and they're hanging by a thread. Detail. Uh, HR1 is a chance to take the Colorado gold standard and export it to the United States to protect the right to vote. HR4, by the way, is the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, which would repair the Shelby County decision I just mentioned. What can state AGs do? I worked with other state AGs on a letter I'll put a link to this too, uh, calling for Congress to pass this law. Unfortunately, and maybe not totally surprisingly, this has become a highly, highly partisan topic. And instead of having voting rights and democracy be outside of politics, we're having political battles around it, which is not the ideal world, the ideal world we could all be committed to protecting democracy first and then fighting to get more votes. Um, but unfortunately, we're not in that world. And um, there's not a another way here. We need to pass HR1 through the process. And as we just adverted to, we may need to see a change to the filibuster procedure to let that happen. Um, one of the ideas is an exception that would require any uh, voting rights or other political safeguards to be immune from the filibuster. Are there other questions? Cindy has another one. Go ahead. All right, you see it now. Uh, I think Cindy, I've got a couple here. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, Cindy, Electoral College. So Cindy, uh, I worked on a case, I think we had a prior meeting where I talked about it involving Electoral College. So I had a chance to think a lot about it. 
the electoral college is a compromise that the founders agreed to because they couldn't come up with a better model of deciding elections. It is not something that was an ideal system. It was a accommodation to a number of different forces, including how would you give power to some states versus other states. Having made that accommodation, here's the problem. It's not easy to amend the constitution, change the electoral college and take power away from some states who already have them. And so we have to recognize the resistance we're gonna to have to change the electoral college. And I am an idealist. So we talk a lot about the idea world. I'm also a realist. And in that sense, I would like us to find a path forward. Um, I will give you the two paths forward that are, um, to my mind, plausible, but still not easy. One is there's a opportunity to do what's called the national popular vote. And that's one of the ways to bring a more democratic model into a uh, world where we don't have the most democratic model of picking our president. We have a model that um, has skewed the focus on these swing states because no Democrat is going to campaign in Alabama, no Republicans going to campaign in California. So you basically have states commit to go with the winner of the popular election. In order for this to go into effect, you need 270 uh, state electoral votes uh, to be on board with this. We'll see if that happens. If it does happen, there'll be legal challenges. My job will be defend those challenges as Colorado signed on to this. The other avenue, which has not gotten talked about as much, would be a constitutional amendment that would accept the electoral votes, the voting power of every state, but would require every state to give partial electoral votes. So if it was a 60-40 election in Colorado and we had 10 electoral votes, six go to one candidate, four goes to the other. If it was 58-42, it would be 5.8 to 4.2. That would create more, again, small d democracy so that Democrats would have an incentive to campaign in Alabama to get a higher fraction. Republicans would have an incentive to campaign in California. I don't know the likelihood we're gonna get either of those paths accomplished, but those are the ways we could go forward. Um, Cal Nebraska does a different way, which is they, elect, they use congressional districts. Who wins the congressional district? So that has more, call it room for democracy. Um, the challenge on that is most states aren't going to do that voluntarily because then they're making their state less attractive than other states. The, the one I mentioned, the fractional requirement would be required of every state at once. So no state could keep the old system while others go to a new system. All right, we got another question here or another two questions here, let me see. Well, we um, have someone who would like to ask you a verbal question if that's all right. Sure thing, let me get Jesse's question first. Sure. Um, let's see. Uh, at large versus single member districts. I, um, in Boulder in particular, um, I uh, have not looked into this issue, so I will need to look into this and see whether this is an issue for concern. Um, there, there are trade-offs of single member districts versus at large plurality. Um, one of the experiments that some are starting to do is have more at large with ranked choice voting. So there are a lot of experiments that are starting to happen um, of different kinds. Out Alaska, for example, now, the next Senate election, election which is gonna be when Lisa Murkowski's up, uh, you have an open primary, the top four people advance to the general and rank choice voting the general. So that'll be interesting to watch. All right, I'll, I'll get the verbal question, then I'll get to Matt's question. Wendy? 
Hi, Phil. Wendy Hall. I have met you a couple of times. Um, I was born and raised in Texas. Uh, all of my roommates, former boyfriends, family are still in Texas. You have alluded to working with other AGs. Um, happiness for me is Texas in my rear view mirror. I'm curious, um, Texas has a AG that is under indictment. Um, has that AG participated with the rest of the state AGs in very many ways? And I mean, I guess you're considered innocent until proven guilty, but when an AG has so openly flouted law, what what do you, what's your read on Texas Attorney General? I'm going to be very um, minimalistic in this answer. Um, I, I will say the following. Only four state AGs didn't sign that letter that I led condemning the January 6th attack. The Texas AG was one of those four AGs. He was actually there on January 6th himself. Does it become difficult to work? How, how can you pull somebody in? Well, here's the other point. I am willing to work with him still. I actually think there are members of Congress who have said they won't work on a bill with someone who voted to deny the election results. And I, I think it was a terrible thing that Texas did filing that case at the Supreme Court. It was a terrible thing that the Texas AG did not sign that letter, but I'd still work with them. You can't, you have to accept that he's still the elected official and I'm not gonna refuse to work with anybody. I'm not gonna condone conduct that I think is wrong. And he has, to my mind, wronged the people of Texas, people in the US with those actions I mentioned, but you're, you're, you're not in a world where you get to pick who you're able to work with. The people are there and the obligation I have is to be as open to working with everybody to solve problems for the people of Colorado. Some asked the question, can I try, and should I try to get involved in other states voting systems? And what I would just say is, I have said, if they want to talk to me about how we do things in Colorado, I'm always here to do that. So you have Matt that wanted to ask a question. I think. <laughs> oh, well, I had uh, put it in the chat, but um, yeah, I, I can ask it. I, uh, you know, um, you talked about Georgia, but there's uh, apparently 46 other states that have uh, uh, legislation on the table uh, regarding voting rights and uh, with um, apparently with the intent to uh, restrict voting. So um, I, my, my question was, uh, do you, in your opinion, should should we as uh, Colorado citizens uh, try to get involved in, in other states' legislations at all? It's a good question. Um, so I would say that Colorado has a lot to offer in the positive category. And we should, as Americans, be committed to advocating for that model and explaining it. Now, the reality is we're unlikely to be effective advocates directly because the Georgia legislature, to take that example, are gonna to respond to the citizens of Georgia. But to the extent we know people who live in Georgia, we know people who live elsewhere, we can share the facts about how Colorado's voting model works and how it produces safe, secure, and easy to use elections. We have a lived experience. We have a voice. We should use it. Would you obviously suggest- Obviously, if HR1 uh, passes on a national level, it will call for national elections that follow 
those models. Yeah. So when you say you, you know, talking to people, would you suggest talking to representatives in those states? So the most effective people you're going to talk to are people in your network. So all of us have relationships, have networks of people we know. We can engage other people in our network around these issues of our democracy and what we can do to advance the goals of democratic self-governance or of living in a democratic republic. If you try to write letters to legislators in Georgia as a Colorado citizen, like I said, you're unlikely to influence directly in that way, but I do think you're potentially gonna be successful in activating and engaging other citizens who might not be focused on this issue, but you who are focused on it can help others think about this as an important priority. So um, this is a lot in the, in the wheelhouse of the Secretary of State, but uh, campaign law, um, voting law, um, I understand, of course, that you work very closely with the Secretary of State. So I, I think this started for me when I was thinking about Citizens United. But what can we do in Colorado, not just about Citizens United? What, what holes do we still have in Colorado about voting and fi campaign finance? Let me take a minute to talk about Citizens United. If I could change one Supreme Court decision, that would be it. Um, that's another threat to our democracy. The rationale since United was wrong on three levels, as it now turns out. First, money is speech and giving people with lots of money unlimited access to use it in elections is problematic. Two, corporations are people and deserve the same rights as people have is also highly problematic. And third, and this is one that has become more true with the test of time, Citizens United was wrong to suggest that transparency in election spending was a given and a foundation that could be relied on to justify the conclusions reached in that case. And you may remember in the State of the Union when President Obama said that decision, Citizens United, is going to enable and allow foreign spending in our elections. And Justice Alito said famously, you lie or that's a lie or you're wrong. In retrospect, I think Obama has the better of the argument over Alito. Why do I say that? Because with the benefit of shell companies and dark money, money is laundered from one committee to another and we can't know for sure where all that money is coming from. It's hard to trace and track the money, particularly in a timely way, so that you would know it before the money was spent in a particular election. That is a threat to our democratic republic. There's a case at the Supreme Court this spring that provides both some hope, but also a cause for some fear. The hope is there's a California law that says if you're spending money in our elections, we want to know your top donors. That law is being challenged by the Koch brothers and their group called Americans for Prosperity. And the argument that they have is they have a right to not be transparent as to who their funders are, because that would compromise their First Amendment free association rights citing a case involving the NAACP in the Deep South during civil rights era. If the court decides in the favor of the Koch brothers and Citizens for Prosperity, that will be a painful irony that will undermine what had been one of the pillars of Citizens United. We have to keep working to overturn Citizens United because campaign finance regulation has been gutted by that decision. What can Colorado do with Citizens United still in the books? Um, we have continued to work on these issues. And as you mentioned, Secretary of State Griswold has been very active on them and I work with her on it. Um, 
I really want us to be able to win this decision at the Supreme Court so that we have that authority to ask about top donors of those spending in our elections. I think dark money can be a threat to democracy um, because if you have spending in elections and you know who it is, you end up with uh, at least some ability to track who's trying to influence the voters. If you don't know who's spending the money, then that again is a threat because you may have groups who are um, in effect being protected by the lack of transparency because if people knew who was spending the money, it might change their views. Okay, further questions? This is a nice opportunity for you to have access to the Attorney General, so. Yeah, well, I'm gonna go with Cindy's question because Cindy uh, cited RBG, who, as you noted, I had a chance to work with. RBG actually said if she could change one opinion of be Citizens United, I agree with her. Um, she also noted that dissents have an audience that's broader than just the court itself. And that is an important point. When she dissented in Shelby County, she was speaking to Congress. So this question is what legislation could address Citizens United? And, and the answer is actually HR1. So HR1 has both issues that address voting and the Colorado model as a way to encourage and enable voting. It also has issues on campaign finance that address dark money in our politics. So that legislation has already been introduced, HR1, you should take a look at it. Um, I mentioned I joined in with the state AG's writing a letter in support of it. Sorry, Tony, you're about to say something else. Uh, yeah, we, we actually have been working on HR1. It's one of the main things that national the National League has asked us to, to do. So we're talking to our constituents. So um, Kathy Wilson has another question. How are you, Kathy? Doing well, Phil, how are you? <laughs> Good, it's nice to see your question. Um, the short version is, I know there are, um, a number of efforts going on right now to address this issue. I am hopeful this won't end up being uh, problematic um, because we are in a tricky spot. Um, I do want to acknowledge the, the, the delays of the census um, reflected unconstitutional actions by the prior administration to try to add a question on the census involving immigration status that I and other state AGs sued and won at the Supreme Court about. But um, we in Colorado are gonna be working to figure out ways to manage with the timeframe of the census to still do the work we have to do. So I'm hopeful, Kathy, this won't end up being um, an issue, but there's still some work to figure all that out. So do you think it's up to the state, to the Supreme Court, Colorado Supreme Court to do, to to judge what we could do? So I'm not gonna say anything further because um, there's a, a bit of ongoing work, but I would just say I'm hopeful it'll all be um, talked about. It sounds like Cindy's seeing there was an overview on, on this issue in CPR talking about this. So maybe that'll yep. give people the context on it. Okay, we'll go to CPR. <laughs> Thank you. No um, so um, what other questions, everybody? Or should we wrap this up? Sounds like someone's dog is ready for to be wrapped it's, up. It's my dog. <laughs> Your dog wants some attention. I get that. Uh, well, Actually, there's somebody at the door. Bill, <laughs> um, yes, Wendy. In chat, Katie Barrett has asked a question. Would you take a look at that? It's oh, hey, Katie. How are you? Um, I see it now. Uh, it's about Mike Kaufman challenging a local law requiring disclosure of dark money donors. Um, I, I don't know the specifics on this, Katie. So I'll have to check it out. Um, I assume this is an Aurora law, Aurora campaign finance law. City, yeah, city of Aurora campaign finance law. And okay. he's, it would be great if we could challenge dark money on a local level. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. I also asked another question about the member of the redistricting commission who believes the election was fraudulent. Um, he was removed as the chairman. Do you think he should have been removed uh, from participating in the commission? I'm gonna turn this back to some of you because I know how hard you worked on the at Y and Z. Is there a procedure for removal of a commissioner? Tony, you're on mute, but you look like you're shaking your head no. Yeah, I, I don't remember. I need to go back and look at it. I know if somebody resigns, there's a procedure, but removal, I don't know. And that's why we might be, that person may just have to stay on the commission because he went through the process just like everybody else did. Um, yeah. But I think the, yeah, Katie, the, the point you folks, for those who haven't looked at it, um, unfortunately, after he became chair, all sorts of information about him came out that apparently was never vetted earlier in the process when he could have been um, excluded. And if there is no removal procedure, Katie, I think that's the answer to your question. And if there isn't, then um, the challenge is amending a constitutional amendment is not easy. And so I hope next time the vetting processes are um, aware of the consequences because when you have a, a collegial commission, it's really important to pick people who have the right mindset, backgrounds and attitudes. And I believe very much in the spirit of Y and Z. I, all believe, I believe in experiments. We're now seeing our first experiment with it and I'm gonna do my best to help make it work because I believe in independent redistricting. I believe in giving citizens opportunity to exercise governmental authority. Um, and Katie has picked up this commission was not off to the best start. And the league is gonna have an observer corps to, to watch all the proceedings um, and get comments about how it's working, so forth and so on, so that if there are changes needed, uh, we will have some information about that. So anything else? It's almost 6.30, so I'm sure you're busy or you want to have dinner so with I, your family. I appreciate how engaged you are, citizens. As I mentioned, we're living in a time that is somewhat delicate for our democracy. Your engagement here in Colorado, as I mentioned, with your networks out of um, state can and do make a difference. And what we've done here in Colorado, Y and Z, for example, electing officials committed to democracy, uh, getting the secondized voters here in the U.S., that's a big deal. That's what we have to do across our nation at a time where the future of our democratic republic is at stake. So I appreciate you all very much. It's an honor to keep working with you. Well, thank you for coming tonight and spending time with us. And um, we'll see you again sometime. <laughs> you got it. Thank you all now. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.